Uh, it's a real pleasure. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Golan Levin. I'm director of the Frank Ratchie Studio for Creative Inquiry, uh, the laboratory of the College of Fine Arts. And um, it's a research and outreach uh, facility dedicated to the development and presentation of atypical, anti-disciplinary, and inter-institutional research and outreach at the intersection of art, science, technology, and culture. Uh, it's our great pleasure this evening to partner with the School of Art uh, on its lecture series. Uh, we are co-hosting with them this wonderful lecture this evening by Lale Meran. She's a professor of New Media Arts at the University of Denver. Uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand this off to Bob Bingham, a professor of the School of Art, uh, for further introductions. Thanks. I might use this one. Good evening. Is this set for your height, Lale? It is. So I won't move it. Um, I'm a little unprepared for this, a grad student. We have a tradition of grad students introducing the speakers, and that grad student became ill, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but welcome, everybody. Um, I just want to remind everybody, uh, Lale Mehran is a alum, an MFA alum from, she asked me not to say, how long ago, um, and she's here for any number of reasons, but firstly, uh, Susani curated her into the alumni exhibit that everybody should go see that opens on Friday. Wish Josh. Wish Josh. Yeah. And, <laughs> and um, as well as the next, um, speaker, Ben Bigelow, who is an undergraduate alum, is also going to be speaking in the studio. I'm not going to run through the whole list of people, but I just want to warn everybody that we're in three different venues this semester, because Kresge wasn't available. Two in Meconomy, the first two here in the studio, and the rest in Kresge. And, um, being in unprepared, I was going to read the introduction that's on the brochure, which if anybody wants to know more about Lale and or know when things are happening, it's on the back table on your way out. Um, but the type is so small for my old <laughs> eyes that I'm not going to do it. And Dan Martin, our illustrious dean, also gave me permission to speed things up and that we really want to hear from Lale. <clears throat> um, uh, though I will, I told her, and I don't want to embarrass her, but I, was, I will always remember her from what she put us through as viewers, which was very profound and intense on a repeating part of Quentin Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs that she exhibited while she was here as a student. That she repeated over and over one of those grosser parts. You know, he has a lot of those kind of parts, but it was intense to say the least. And I have not witnessed one of her pieces in real life, which we all know how important that is, but I have seen it on her website and glad to see her doing so well. It's a true honor to be here. I'm, I'm deeply pleased by the warmth, the greetings, the stories, which I was not prepared for, um, and, and apparently the impression I've left, which is somewhat traumatic, which was um, not, um, I would say, uh, known to me at the time or now. <laughs> um, I had so many thank yous. I'm going to rush through this so I can get to um, the meat of my talk, as it were. Deep gratitude to Golan, Suzani, Josh, the School of Art, the Miller Gallery, Bob, um, Wayne, and I'm sure, uh, Kara, uh, Margaret. So I'll just stop there because I'm sure I'm leaving folks out. Um, I hope you, to see you all this Friday. Um, myself and um, many amazing other artists will be in the exhibit. Um, um, I'm frankly totally thrilled to be able to see much of the work myself in person. So I'm going to share with you uh, a whole lot of work. I'm going to go as fast as I can to stay on, on schedule. Um, I'm going to talk about a lot of processes and behind the scenes and to explain things that in general are not shared or seen um, 
in the understanding of, of works um, on site. The first project I'm gonna discuss is called the Xerxes Society. It actually started here um, when I was a grad student in 1990-something uh, <laughs> um, for my MFA in 97. Uh, it had a culmination of the first iteration of um, this very long-standing work, which is now almost in its 20th year. Um, so basically what happened was I got to grad school, I was crazy excited, I made these um, really politically charged works, I showed it to my family in Iran, they completely freaked out, I freaked out, I was going to drop out of school, and I had a meeting with Brian Rogers, who very calmly, um, and as always, with great um, sensitivity and, and I would say compassion, uh, explained some things to me which made me stay in grad school, so I'll forever be grateful to him for that. But what happened was I ended up changing from this very direct, um, frankly, quite angry, uh, not that I'm less angry, <laughs> I'm just trying to hide it better, I'm better at camouflage these days, possibly. Um, so I was quite pissed, um, I, I wanted to talk about things, and so I had a very direct approach. Um, that had consequences and remains to have quite um, uh, dire and, um, unfortunate consequences for myself and my family there, and so I, I changed. I changed tones, I changed everything. I changed the way I think, the way I make, the way I approach people, um, situations, everything. And so my work became the subterfuge of metaphors and symbols, heavily, heavily um, layered in, in ways that I would hopefully be able to get out of jail if, if you know, I was called into question. Um, and so these references, um, led to this um, very complicated, fictitious narrative um, in which the key character, the main um, uh, protagonist or antagonist, depending on which side you take, is uh, a fanatic. And uh, the fanaticism is about the preservation of butterflies and moths at any cost. So I chose, um, again, going quite deep into the symbols, I needed to pick a name, I needed to, you know, create this entire um, fiction to be believable, and I was um, very much focused on having something that had to do with North America, the US, and its relations to other countries, again, specifically the Middle East. And so the Cecropia moth is actually one of the largest moths in North America. Um, and it, it took my interest because of um, what appears to be these, these crescent moons, um, which again is symbolic in Islam. And so I, I chose this character, changed the name somewhat. I knighted him. He became Sir Samuel Cropia. Um, the, the story has become so complex, frankly, I can't keep up with it, so I made a little chart for myself just to know what's happening and who's where, and um, people tend to ask really intense questions and want to go further back, and so I always um, have this on hand to, to be fresh. So in the beginning, um, uh, there was quite blurred boundaries between art, science, and politics. Both of my parents are scientists, they're chemists. We um, had to leave Iran in uh, quite a hurry at the start of the Islamic Revolution. And I've um, always been with them when they go to the lab. It was just part of what we did on the weekend was to check on things. So th I would say that they're quite embedded and um, in some ways uh, committed deeply to the sciences. So I decided in this uh, basically um, slow navigation into becoming an amateur scientist, and specifically entomology, and more specifically into Lepidoptera, which is the moths and butterflies, um, that I need to do some research. I became uh, in contact with uh, many of the scientists actually at the Carnegie Museum who were intensely generous and gave so much of their time to explain a lot of things to me. Um, this started uh, as a film, 16 millimeter film, in which I was collaborating with a lot of folks um, at Pittsburgh Filmmakers. And uh, it's actually in Pat Bell and Gillen's um, backyard, which is quite vast. And so um, these, these roots at CMU were quite deep for me and the generosities and ways of uh, expanding, again, my way of being in the world. Uh, this is me still being short and too short for the camera. Um, I had a cinematographer and all kinds of talent there, including Steffi Domike, who's uh, one of my dear grads of uh, uh, colleagues and, and friends who had a lot more experience than I did in film, and so she was on site um, for many of the, 
the um, events to make sure that um, basically things were going well, including I remember one day, just quick tangent and fast, um, uh, I didn't have a sock for the mic and it was really windy and Steffi literally took off her sock from her shoe and put it on there and I thought, oh, okay, this is awesome, she's, she's brilliant. Um, this is one of the very few glimpses of Sir Cropia. He's a British actor that I hired um, for um, to play the role and who was actually um, quite amazing at being uh, Sir Cropia. Uh, the next stage as this has continued was um, Manuel's disappearance. Um, and this is um, based on Manuel being um, basically my father. And uh, in this I, I needed much, much assistance. I needed a lot of um, material. So this um, uh, trunk that you see before you is actually available to the viewer to go through. You can read everything, you can rearrange things. It's a, it's a point of investigation, it's a point of, of hands-on understanding in a room that has um, all kinds of surveillance photos all around it and a very large Persian rug that you walk on to approach the trunk. Um, this was in the Pittsburgh Biennial at the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts uh, years ago. For the documentation, I decided to dress up as Parvana Rojas, which is um, the character's name, wearing a very traditional Iranian um, wedding dress. And and so here you see the character going through the trunk, trying to understand what's happened in the disappearance of her father. Um, I've done this presentation a couple of times, and when it was at the, um, actually, um, uh, the biennial, it was really strange because um, Vicki Clark introduced me, but some folks got there late and missed the part about Lale Mehran playing the role of. And so they missed that, and then I was in character giving my artist talk and saying, hello, my name is Pavana Rojas, right after Vicky had said what my real name is. And I go through this whole thing about my father's missing and I'm trying to find him and I'm really concerned because I think there's things amok and, and uh, you know, it has to do with politics and I can't get him out of the Peruvian Andes and, and this whole deep thing. And afterwards, um, a woman came up quite shattered um, whose father had disappeared. And so it was this, and Vicky was really excited. I didn't know what to do. I was um, uh, barely out of grad school and totally in a panic, but she handled it like a pro. Um, so <laughs> these things happen. I, I, my characters are so real to me. I discuss them as though they're real people. I'll see a book and I'll be like, Samuel would really love this. I need to get this for him. Or, you know, I haven't heard from Manuel or I wonder how Parvana is. So um, these characters in some ways are, are a way for me to cope with some very serious things going on that I can't quite handle um, and, and get me in such a depressed funk that I can't do any work. And so they're, again, they're outlets. They're safe outlets to talk about some really heavy things. Um, the trunk was filled with butterflies that I'd collected and the Carnegie had donated um, in patterns of countries' flags as well as uh, photos of soldiers. I was able to um, literally take thousands of photographs at the Carnegie. I believe this drawing is actually by Zach Precop. Um, I had a lot of folks helping on that project, and I think he did the scientific drawing. I was really interested in photos that evoked specific um, imagery. Uh, photos that had, um, again, the crescent moon shapes, either um, colors of flags of specific countries that the U.S. Um, was having points of contention with, or eye spots, which look like targets. The next iteration was called uh, Sir Samuel Corpio's Private Laboratory, and it really was a view into his uh, thought processes and possible agenda. And here there were um, uh, all these cones hung, which you may have noticed also in one of the first uh, images, which is from the film, in which they used to do mass collections of insects, so they would go into a forest, basically set off poison fog, collect everything, and mark them. And so this was in a uh, gallery, actually, at West Virginia University years ago, and I w really wanted to have this immersive space. I wanted to have a space where you felt you were in the space of somebody's mind. Um, so the entire floor, um, with the help of the theater department, was um, I had custom cut gobos, so to look like the floor of a forest might um, through the, the sun through the trees. So uh, this was in some ways, I, I had I'd, um, in an organic way begun to make spaces of experience. It wasn't a very calculated or um, deliberate, but I realized that spaces are a great influence to me, and so I've uh, continued to um, manipulate and create um, 
places where I can have uh, rather um, intense conversations often. Um, this is a close-up of a moth, a satellite photo of the Middle East, specifically Iran, some surveillance photos of other scientists, um, the next iteration was the inverse. It was Cercropia's public lab, so it was the public face. And um, this was done at the Georgia Museum of uh, Art and in collaboration with the entomology department, the genetics department, and the geography department to bring it all together. Everything in here was scientifically accurate. It was really important to me that um, the space was set up to look like a real lab, and in some ways it was set up so well that people didn't realize it was art, even though, again, I had on the wall, you know, this whole fictitious narrative, Cercropia, explaining the entire thing, um, including explaining how a Cercropia moth is one of the largest moths in North America, and the Xerxes Society makes reference to the ancient uh, king of Persia. So it was all laid out, but as soon as folks walked into this lab that was so scientifically believable, they kind of ignored the entire um, very large wall placard. Um, I had student performers uh, working. Um, I was not the boss of the lab. I was just a, a lowly PhD student trying to work with a really well-known scientist so I could get ahead. Um, my student who was the boss became quite bossy and it was uh, pretty amazing to see what happens um, when you give uh, folks roles. So this is a, a pinning station and then uh, again butterflies. Um, so throughout the entire space, there was hints and ideas um, that this was a, a space of international uh, dialogue. So there were these little envelopes um, sent uh, allegedly from different places with different um, text, so different languages, so this one uh, is in Arabic. And so folks would come around and kind of notice and be like, oh, where's this from? And you would just um, very plainly, you know, uh, factually say, you know, oh, that one's from, you know, North Korea. And they'd be like, oh, and you were like, and then you would just kind of keep working. And, you know, sometimes they would, they would ask, like, how'd you get it? And you would say things like, well, butterflies and moths don't understand borders, right? So you have to do the research. This is how it's done. And it makes sense, and they would agree. Um, and so, uh, again, there was just so much material there, so much material that was so, um, you know, science eye candy that some things would be uh, forgotten or, or dismissed. Um, but, you know, as always, there, there are folks who are so um, meticulous in paying attention to the details, and that's, that's always such a wonderful thing to be called out. So um, this one, for example, they were like, what are all the dots? And I was like, oh, those are butterflies traveling. They're like, yeah, butterflies can't travel that far across the ocean. And so I'd be like, oh, no, no, like, those are butterflies on a, cr on a crate. Those are butterflies on a, on a, you know, airplane. Like, we're tracking them. So it's not necessarily um, them flying. They're, they're being transported. And so, again, and it would just be this kind of, like, um, and when I do performances, I am so committed to it. Like, you cannot break me from that. So they would just probably walk away saying, wow, that poor PhD student is, like, really clueless. Like, they have no idea what's going on. Um, this was my super bossy uh, undergraduate student um, who was working at the DNA station. Um, and this was a grad student at the time who... Uh, was, um, you know, in, in his character, stealing from uh, the lab. And so there was a whole scene we had. He got busted. Why are you stealing? And he had debts and, you know, school debts. Um, so everybody had these characters, and I'd ask them not to discuss them with each other. So basically, over the month um, that we did, the, or six weeks, rather, that we did all these performances every hour the museum was open, these characters started to clash and weird things started to happen um, in, in so many weird ways that like students outside of the space would come and complain to me like you know so and so is doing this and you know I was trying again not to give too much away because I wanted some things to, to fall apart I wanted this to have um, some elements of uh, you know it was over dramatized but some things that actually can happen and do happen um, the museum, it was an art museum. They were freaked out about us bringing anything alive there. They kept talking about paint being eaten and, you know, and I didn't want to um, cause all of the paint to be eaten and paintings to be destroyed because that would not be my intention or purpose. Um, so basically, um, a couple times a week I would go and get dead critters and they really started to stink. So like you had to like get, get fresh dead things. Um, so these are basically parasites which are also really important in the ecosystem of um, the Lepidoptera. And so that would be another conversation I would have about 
parasitism and what it means when you become infected with something that to you is so important, um, this ideology that basically you allow it to destroy yourself. And so again, if you've seen those crazy caterpillar videos, right, where the wasps lay the eggs and the caterpillars behave in crazy ways, um, and it's, it's um, to protect the, the eggs, the host, and then they get eaten and they die. And so again, I was having this like quite violent conversation about what it means to to be part of a fanatical ideologies, and you know, giving as as um, uh, I would say um, uh, expansive uh, description as possible to talk about what it would mean to to be um, to have this level of um, ideology or, or parasitism. Um, there were also books there and people would get crazy, like why do you have books about Russia or Asia? And again, say like, there are no limits to this, you know, no, Sokropi is not a communist, but you know, he needs to understand how to navigate politics because this is his business. Um, this is uh, the one day when literally the, the two students started to have an argument um, because they'd figured something out, but not understanding that um, it was all fiction. Uh, there were weird recording devices everywhere, but open enough to kind of show that these things were happening. Um, every day at the same time, we would get a FedEx package. At first, I was actually sending them, but then I couldn't afford it. So we would have one of the guards just come and give a fake FedEx package and people knew when it was. And so then they would start showing up to see what we got. And what we were getting was basically um, coordinates as well as these little images. The images over time uh, laid out butterfly, um, the veins of a butterfly wing. Um, and folks would come and be like, oh, I know what this is. And be like, oh, we don't know what it is. You know, Sir Kropia just sent it to us and he's asking us to lay them out and we'll understand later, but we don't know what it is. And there was a, a woman um, from the geography department and she was like, I know exactly where this is. And she was totally right because they were satellite images, again, from um, countries of, of contention. And she was, um, really out to get Cercropia. Like she, she was like, I need to know who he is. And this like, the like things are not okay in this lab. And it was fantastic. Every time she'd come by, we would totally panic, but I was like, awesome. Like she's gonna, you know, take us down. Um, but so again, like these things were, you know, and we were totally oblivious as all of the employees of, of the lab. Um, but they, they were really important to have this conversation with um, the general public. Like, University of Georgia has football days, and they keep the museum open. And frankly, people were there just to use their facilities. So they're, they're there to use the bathroom, and they're like, what's happening here? And so you would explain it. They would get really excited, and then they would come back, you know, the next day during lunch hour or whatever and bring friends and family. And so um, we actually um, ended up having quite a cult following, which was, um, again, not entirely the point for Socropia's critique. Um, the last uh, iteration of this um, was a video, and this is a really short excerpt. The full span of the video uh, goes across three continents with some um, possibly iconic uh, sites where um, you might recognize where it is, and that's not of importance. But what does matter is that it's about a journey. It's about understanding that Sokropia is now in his 70s, and he's, he's, he's feeling the pressure of time. And that's actually quite a dangerous thing because he wants to leave his legacy and he wants to leave an impression and he wants to finish what he started. Um, and so there's some of these, again, um, heavily loaded metaphors and symbols with the pomegranate and different uh, cultures and religions being both about fertility and life as well as death. And so um, I, I won't go into the, the full details of, of all of them, but it's, it's important that all of the, um, I would say, visuals um, are coherent and cohesive and holistic and all come together um, to talk about the different aspects of the, the same piece. 
So uh, after this is a, a piece called Entropic Order. Um, so in this family of the entropic, uh, the piece that um, I will be showing you um, is, is uh, this piece is quite large. It's about a 16 by 12 two axis drawing machine with about 2,000 pounds of black sand. Um, so when Suzani and Josh were kind enough to approach me, they were like, we really like this piece. And I was like, yeah, I really like it too, but like, how am I going to get it from Denver to you guys? It's just not going to happen. It's just too big, too expensive. Um, and so uh, with the help of Chris Coleman, who's uh, doing the um, engineering and fabrication, um, I'm doing a smaller version, which you can see on Friday. <laughs> That's like product placement, right? Like super slick. Um, and so uh, this became a point where um, I realized that I, I do a lot of these performances and I, I'm really interested in having a conversation with the viewer, um, but I can't always be there to to put that on. And so this was one of the first pieces, I would say, um, in a line where the interactivity has taken over that. So um, I use the, you know, the, the kind of technical components, but they are to serve my ideas. My ideas always come first, and then it rolls out from there to the material, um, the, the point of um, interaction, the space, um, everything else. So this drawing machine, uh, it was really important uh, to have, again, the components. Um, the black sand is actually not black sand, it's coal slag, so it's a, a petroleum byproduct. Um, this really large machine hovers above you. And what it does is it continues to draw this really perfect geometric pattern until you enter the space. And when you enter the space, sensors go off, um, and it basically speeds up the machine, and it goes out of whack. Um, and what's really interesting is uh, when the piece is, is shown twice now um, locally in the Denver area, and um, people will just hang out for a really long time, and some people get really mad when other people walk in because it, it you know, uh, interrupts the machine. But other folks, I've heard them have like these deep philosophical conversations about how it's actually more beautiful when it's disrupted, that the perfection is actually quite boring because it's repeated. And so again, this conversation is um, about ideologies and how they may appear to be so perfect, but once you have agendas and once you have people that enter, um, it can change severely. And again, it can change to something that you might find more beautiful and more poetic, or it can really be disruptive. Um, and uh, so, the, uh, the pendulum that you saw is um, referencing um, the very top minaret um, at uh, the House of God in, in um, it's the Grand Mosque uh, in um, the Kaaba. So it's the largest mosque in Saudi Arabia. And the patterns, again, are quite uh, referential to Islamic patterns. Um, I grew up with these, I find them fascinating. They have um, really beautiful, deep spiritual understanding of the different points and um, how every level that crosses over means something different and is part of the body and, and um, the planet and things like that. So not all of this is uh, deeply rooted in a monotheistic religion, but it has been um, consumed by that uh, since its origin. So there is also, you know, the question of what to do about the machine sound. Um, I have to admit I wasn't fond of it at first because it just seemed so tangential for me. I was like, oh, this thing is making a sound. I'm really not into it. I, I just want to see the drawing and trying to figure out how to isolate it so it didn't make a sound. But I really wanted the machine to be visible because it was really important to have this hovering apparatus. Um, and then after spending time with it, I, I began to appreciate the sound. I, I liked the um, very basic um, mechanics of it. And it also um, definitely references as it speeds up. And so if I didn't, or if I was able to basically sound eliminate or dampen, then you wouldn't have this direct reference to um, the ability to understand that your motion in that space is speeding it up. So um, it became a lot more visceral in that way. it up here. 
Um, the last time I showed this was really interesting. There was a gentleman who was running laps around the piece. <laughs> And there were folks just screaming at him. It was just totally insane. I, didn't, I thought it was, like, really interesting. I don't know. Yeah, he was doing the crazy, like, running laps, trying to make it do it. And, and um, my work isn't about uh, the conversation of technology. So the technology for my work is often kind of hidden or in the background. Um, and uh, also because of that, I um, most of the time don't have a one-to-one -one trigger correlation. So it's not the whole, hey, um, you know, what is it, the cactus or dunking the clown. Um, so it won't react. So there's always a delay. And so, but it, it was really interesting the last time with um, getting exercise, watching the machine. One of the largest projects I've done is called Men of God, Men of Nature. And it was at the uh, Daniel Liebeskind um, Museum, the Denver Art Museum in which there's no right angles in the entire space. Um, it's totally insane. That was the gallery. So uh, after spending, and this is one of those projects, as many museums have, it took three years to implement and dialogue. And they were completely freaked out about the subject matter, like you're bringing what, where, and how is this going to work? And um, you know, being concerned about having any kind of uh, heavy political presence at a museum in the US. So uh, again, after spending a lot of uh, time in this um, space, which had nothing level except for the floor, it seemed to me that the perfect thing to have in there is the perfect cube. Um, so you know, a, a big fan of, of, of Judd and uh, Stanley Kubrick. Um, I wanted to have a monolith in there. I wanted to have this big thing that was everything and nothing and had so much power. And, and you know, I don't know if I was competing or collaborating with Liebeskind or what was happening, but it was just, um, it was overwhelming that I needed to have this perfect um, cube. Um, and also, again, referencing the Kaaba, the house of God. Um, so if anybody's familiar, uh, during Hajj, um, millions of, of um, pilgrims go and they um, basically do a series of um, uh, pilgrimages uh, and one of them is to this exact site where you go around the house of God in a counterclockwise direction as is the orbit of the earth. And so uh, again, it, it's hard coming from this background not to be um, very much, uh, I would say, influenced by it. So uh, some behind the scenes, it took almost eight months uh, of full-time fabrication to, to create this um, really large um, piece. Uh, it took the entire geography department and special permission to get um, detailed topography of the Middle East. I, I didn't have access to it. They had to get access to it. Um, I don't understand entirely why topography, um, you know, I wasn't looking for any silos or anything like that. I just wanted the Earth's typography. Um, but again, these things that you come across and then you end up having conversations about why you can't do something or, um, you know, what, what's made it uh, so precious all of a sudden, I think are really important. Um, to create that, uh, due to, to limited funds, a CNC machine had to be fabricated, which again, um, uh, grateful to uh, Chris Coleman, um, who was able to fabricate this so it could be built, um, and here it is on site with some scale. Uh, over the time uh, that it was open, so it was uh, um, on view for over 10 months, um, almost half a million people came through the museum because they had these major blockbuster shows. Um, I don't know how many people saw the work, but um, I was thrilled that I never got a phone call from the museum because as I um, uh, was referencing earlier, they were quite freaked out um, about the show. So the entire staff was on um, what they called a level orange alert. I'm not sure. And they were super sweet, the guards. Like, they would just be like, nothing happened today. And I was like, oh my god, that's great, I guess. Like, you're freaking me out even more than before. Um, and if you went in there and hung out late, like a little too long or whatever they thought was too long, they would like come in there like paratroopers. It was totally insane. Like, I would be in there, you know, taking photographs, and they didn't know like or notice me and they would like run in there and just look at you and then like run out and um, so nothing happened in fact I had um, really incredible conversations with people um, about what it means to have uh, these philosophies that are part of who you are and um, basically guide your actions um, whether it is uh, to be kind and have empathy or to kill 
So uh, another thing that was really important to me was to have a very different understanding of the inside and the outside. So the outside is completely smooth with, um, again, the topography of the Middle East wrapped around. Uh, the inside has quite ornate uh, arabesque patterns that go from the, from the ground up. And here's a CNC machine working nonstop and it being installed. And then the uh, fully installed um, version of it. Uh, so there was also nine monitors, and as you entered the space, um, you triggered a motion detector, which again was uh, not part of the work or irrelevant in you understanding that that's what happened. Um, but what would happen was there's about um, 30,000 of these characters on a nine continuous monitors that would start to go around you in a counterclockwise sense. So in some ways you were in the cube um, in which uh, the actual house of God you were not permitted to go into um, as a regular uh, visitor. And here's one of the walls. Here's some of the heads. There were four um, various behaviors that these um, orbs had. They, they were aggressive, some were passive, some were chaotic, and some were normal. And if you watched one, you could see it like either getting pushed back or being really aggressive and coming to the front. Um, and I just thought it was really interesting, the things that I would hear from people. I, would, I really like eavesdropping about my art, so I would go in there, nobody knew who I was, and I'd turn my badge around, and they just thought I worked there. And they would start to explain my work to me, which is, actually, I, I think it's an like amazing opportunity if you can ever you know, be there to hear that, because there's always this insight that you're not aware of, or things that they bring to it. Um, and so, like one person uh, told me they, they felt like they'd, uh, they were elevated, and. I wasn't quite entirely sure what they meant. Um, another person like said they felt like a rock star, and I thought that was amazing, because um, these things come at you, and they just like go around in this orb. Um, so uh, here's a slightly goofy picture of me with a flash, but just for scale. So in this space, um, I'm, I'm deeply trying to create an environment, a circumstance, um, a landscape, to inspire and incite critical questions. As you entered the space, it was quite dark and it would take a few moments for your eyes to adjust. And as they did, the topography on the cube would start to reveal itself. And as I would, again, I, I would try to, since this was in Denver, I would visit quite often just to see what was happening or if there's something wrong, um, you know, if there was any emergency. And I really appreciated seeing the interaction of um, different demographics there. And, you know, you're not supposed to touch the art, but um, I felt, and I felt really bad for all of the docents at the um, museum, but people were just slathering themselves on this. Um, I think because it, it looked like granite, but I couldn't afford granite, and it was, you know, all kinds of logistical issues too, and so they, they loved the cool touch, and so everybody was just touching it constantly. And again, that was really interesting to me, and um, I would say for most, probably not understood as a reference, again, for the house of God, which, you know, when you can, you get close enough to touch. So as you round the corner, um, I had the door on the on the uh, side facing the wall, so it actually wasn't, in some ways, a welcome open door. You had to make the effort to, to walk a few steps to go around and in, at which point you're greeted by all of this. The arabesque pattern started in a perfect geometry uh, towards the floor, and as they went up towards the ceiling, they basically broke down in pattern and became quite chaotic, um, and then reconfiguring again. These small monitors are not specialized monitors, they're just regular monitors, and I basically am only using a third of them, um, of the screen, but I really wanted them to be these turrets, so they, they look like these inset gun turrets that are going around. So again, it, for me, there's a lot about having the perspective of what does it mean when you're in, on the outside looking in and what does it mean when you're on the inside looking out and you possibly need to be on defense all the time. Sorry, I'm talking over this, but I'm going to turn it up for a second for the audio. to 
help me with the audio because I wanted to, it's a seven point surround sound in the space, but because of the acoustics of the crazy gallery, it was really um, quite difficult to do. But I also wanted someone who understands audio much better than I do. And what I wanted from him to do was basically, um, I was explaining to him, I wanted Borscht. And he was like, what are you talking about? And it's actually, uh, I was doing a poor translation because if anybody's Persian here, and I know Ali knows, I wanted Osh, which is like a really thick kind of stew in which like everything tastes like the other thing and you can't quite separate it. So it's not like an al dente soup where you're like, oh, and here's a carrot and it tastes like this. So I wanted everything to be mixed. And so basically this is a combination of um, helicopter sounds, bees, um, the three monotheistic religions, um, sound snippets that again have been altered such that they're not quite so evident. Um, there's a mall in Morocco, um, uh, one in, um, or uh, rather a bazaar in Morocco, uh, a mall in Minneapolis. So there are all these, again, audio pieces from kind of east-west that are brought together in a way that coexist, um, but with sometimes isolation of the audio. So again, I would walk into this space and it'd be so strange, like someone would be leaning against the wall and I was like, what are they doing? And they were listening for that specific audio coming out of that speaker. Um, and. I, I couldn't have been more flattered to have so you know folks who are um, so invested in either trying to figure it out or or just experiencing it on such a deep level. As I shared earlier, I'm really interested in spaces, and I know this gallery quite well. And something that is seldom used in this space is this upper corner you're about to see. Um, in general, the tech is hidden there and they use it to like use for projections. And that's actually the favorite part of the gallery for me is this apex. I find it to be this hidden corner where everything is coming out of. Um, and so then there's this animation of these orbs which reference the orbs inside um, that of this crack in the very apex of the gallery are just pouring out endlessly and they just don't stop and so some folks would come in turn around and see that and they thought that was the art and they would just sit leaning on the cube and just watch that the whole time you, you know again like I was just pleased they were hanging out for so long the last piece I'm going to share with you is called unclaimed and it's a collaboration with Chris Coleman uh, this piece in some ways is um, slightly different uh, but the same uh, as far as wanting to have a dialogue about a, a larger uh, picture and global issues. Um, it's different in that it doesn't quite reference my um, uh, specific uh, Islamic roots. Uh, so Unclaimed is about the troposphere, so it's the, the uh, layer of air, um, as you can see in this little illustration, uh, it's it's the it's the layer of air above uh, in the U.S. above the rooftops, um, but below federal aviation control. It's where birds fly, kites, and hobbyist drones are. Um, and so, interested in the flow of air and what it means to have um, this this understanding of something that you put out and it comes back, or somebody else puts out and comes back, um, whether you're doing it intentionally or not. Uh, so some uh, of the behind the, the uh, scenes amount of labor that went into this, just a lot of fans, a lot of testing. Um, this is our spaces uh, at school. I wish we had a studio like this, but we don't. Um, it was like 800 soldering uh, wires. Um, I still have to say I'm not a good solderer. I, I know how to solder. It, it's just, um, it's a point of pride. I, I don't think I'm making, I'd be a good jewelry maker, which makes me sad, but <laughs> I'm going to keep working on it. So yeah, eight, 800 um, uh, tins later and still no good. Um, again, some of the eye candy, um, some tests, um, some uh, 3D printing, lots of 3D printing, and then sharing the 3D prints back into the world, uh, testing the, the lights that we needed for the table, testing how it would be to have a sensor where you blow, and then practical things like um, 
not really thinking people would steal your lovely 3D things. Um, and then realizing, oh man, what if they did steal these? Like, don't care, but then the work's not going to look right. And then you have to measure meticulously and laser cut a stupid sheet of acrylic to then, you know, have them pop through, but then they don't really do it so easily. And so how does that work out? Um, yeah, so a, a, a intense amount of labor uh, for things that are invisible. Um, things like getting over being on the cherry picker, even if it's not your favorite place to be. So there was a uh, in total, 181 printed 3D buildings, 192 fans, over 38,000 LED lights, um, 192 relay switches, um, and uh, over 1,200 hours of labor. Again, none of that matters, except I just wanted to share behind the scenes. So something that was important in this piece was we didn't want it to look like um, possibly this interactive work wasn't on. This happens quite often if you're not familiar with how um, this type of digital work comes across. And so even if nobody was interacting with it, we had a breeze, as it were, going through. So the table was always doing some kind of light across and these fans above were constantly igniting. So it was really important for us to have this ability to have a very physical and visceral level of interaction. So you would blow and other people could blow. And again, what was interesting was somebody would you know, walk through the room, kind of look, keep going, and then like their kid would figure it out and then bring back the entire family and then they would all like start blowing and like trying to get their breath to meet and those things are, are again especially for conversations like this so important um, to understand this level of experience especially when it comes across with uh, multiple um, users or um, breaths that we're talking about. We also had these monitors on either side that had a surveillance point of view. So you could see what was happening. The entire show, um, what I was told was that it looked like quite easy. And I was like, that's awesome. You know, because again, it wasn't about this level of, of technology or complexity. It had to do with this physical experience in the space. Um, also had, had a woman who kept saying, where'd you get the ocean sounds from? And I was like, no, 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 it's just plastic. And she's like, no, 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 the ocean sound, where's that one from? And so this, this insertion of your understanding of the physicality um, in a physical space and what it means to you is, is really important, both as someone who's making the work, but also learning and then integrating some of that into the next um, body of work. There was also a set of LED lights on either side that helped force a 24-hour cycle. And so when you were in there, you would basically see dusk to dawn happening um, within about 10 minutes. And that was also important to have, again, a feeling of passage of time and understanding of what it means as this air is uh, going around. So it's not a color correction issue, it's intentional. And I'm gonna stop there. Um, I do often c collaborate, and uh, I was part of a collective um, from 2000 to 2005, a uh, suburb says. So I just wanted to um, also do a shout out and um, website links uh, to those folks as well. And thank you.